And I've been wondering if you were ever going to give me the Darth Vader line. Uh, the Darth Vader line. Yeah. When I left you, I was but the pupil. Now I am the master. Oh, yes. You said, did say that. Something to that effect in your email. Uh, no, no, no. That's, that's not true. You know, we're just, uh, we're just, just old friends and colleagues now. There you go. That's a nice way to put it. It's just amazing to think, I mean, you know, 10 years ago, uh, versus now. I mean, super congratulations on a position at UCLA. Thank you. Yeah, it's, 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 I'm happy to be, uh, to be back. So I've, it's, it's interesting, you know, it's been, it feels like a homecoming, but then also some things are different and all of a sudden you're, you know, doing all this faculty junk. So, um, yeah, right. Uh, what, yeah. what kind of classes are you teaching? Uh, so I've been, well, so I, I've been back since January and, uh, and maybe as expected, like while I was been, while I was in Munich, uh, nothing, uh, there was no Anatolian taught. So, uh, so I taught Hittite and uh for two quarters and uh and then i taught some seminars some stuff some stuff for the program in indian studies we taught uh you know we run that uh, first year uh, sequence for all our under uh, for all our graduate students where they take like indo-european phonology morphology and syntax and so uh, i taught the middle part of that class the morphology component and um uh, i ran a seminar i ran a graduate seminar and uh sort of problems in indo-european sort of you know, kind of theoretical problems in Indo-European morphology. And I don't know, I thought something else too. It's it's kind of been a whirlwind, frankly. I just like feel very busy. That's good though. I mean, those are great classes. What? So how do you go about teaching Hittite? I guess I'm sort of starting this interview over. start this video by thanking my Patreon supporters who helped make it possible for me to make a living teaching subjects of my expertise in the world's most beautiful places. And uh, to everyone who buys my books, thank you so much. So but, but I'll, 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 okay. say for the, I'll say for the sake of uh, uh, those who are not returning to this, because you, you're, you're a fan favorite. Um, Mm. We have today Professor, I can now say Professor Anthony Yates, yeah. University of California, Los Angeles, of the uh, Indo-European program. Uh, we have known each other since like 2011. Uh, I think it's right. Yeah, that's yeah, that's right. That's what. And 2011 is when I showed up at UCLA, and uh, is that is that also when you when you showed up? I can't remember if we yeah. arrived at the exact same time. Yeah, I think we both did show up at the same time. Um. Yeah, and I think this is your third time on here. It's the third time on here. I looked back, I found the other interviews. We look so we look younger. Like you can see them <laughs> because there are these big jumps. Like I look very young in the first one. And 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 then, you know, kinda like, okay, it's still recognizable of the second one where I was in Munich and then uh uh and now 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 look at us, all gray haired. God, all. I know. I know. Just just <laughs> yesterday, um I was telling some friends here who kind of hadn't known me in that in the middle period. I said, you know, actually, when I showed up at UCLA, I had long hair. And they're like, no, no way. I don't believe it. And I actually found a picture. Yeah, of, ponytail uh, guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was part of my shame. But uh, I showed them a picture of you and me at Idlewild. It was just the first thing that I could find. I was like, oh, man, it's so long ago. Uh, that really was. That was that was a heck of a time, though. That's a... Uh... Uh, I, you know, I, that was the only time I made it there and I've always wanted, I'm, I'm, it's on my agenda of things to go back to. I thought that place was really neat. It's great. Yeah. Exit, well, it's exit 100 on the interstate, so it's hard to miss. Uh, but I love it up there. Uh, it always reminded me of here. I think that's why I liked it. Um, but okay. I, I, I was asking, and I am kind of curious about this. How, how do you go about teaching Hittite? Like what, what materials do you use? 
Yeah. So uh, there's a kind of a number of options now in, in, in a way that there wasn't so much in, in, in even just in pretty recent times. So like there's a pretty decent, so, so, okay. So maybe I should say where I actually use is the tutorial that accompanies there. So um, uh, Harry Hoffner and Craig Melcher wrote sort of the authoritative reference grammar on Hittite. It was published in 2008 and there's a new edition for people who are interested coming soon. So don't, 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 don't spend any bucks and buy the old edition, even if you can find it in print, there's a new one coming in the next, uh, I would say the next year and year and a half or so. Okay. Um, but in any case, it came, it came in two pieces. So there's the there's a volume one that's the reference grammar itself, and then there's a very short volume two that is the tutorial. And basically, it just includes what well it starts with basically toys Hittite sentences in transliteration. Uh, actually, they're not even in transliteration at first; they're in so-called broad transcription. So it kind of read it's, it almost reads like you're reading I don't know a Latin text or something. You know, everything is scripta continua broken up into things that you know you can kind of pronounce like english you could you could kind of pronounce them like words um and then it moves on to transliteration um uh, but at any rate it's uh it, you know so they, there's this little volume and it's again it starts with these toy hittite sentences and they start to then they start to be like based on real hittite sentences and and then they actually introduce some real hittite sentences to the mix uh this this is a, a i think it's quite I mean, it's quite good for what it does, but it, it is not something that you can use uh, to teach yourself. So it works for me in the classroom because I, I supplement it with lecture notes and I, you know, I basically teach the, uh, I kind of provide the accompanying grammatical material in lesson by lesson handouts. Um, if anyone is interested in these handouts, I'm, I'm happy to share them. These are just like, he's okay. in teaching handout. Um, people can feel free to get in touch and I'll, I'll send them along. Um, but, but I, so that's what I do, but I, I, you know, I'll just mention that if people are interested, uh, there are two kind of uh, nice introductory textbooks that are, you know, recent and modern and are quite, quite good. You could use them to teach yourself. And that would be Theo Vandenhout has this uh, little volume called The Elements of Hittite. Um, that's nice because it also introduces the cuneiform, uh, the, 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 actual, the actual script in which the Hittite is written um, uh, and to you. Uh, that's, that's a nice feature of it that, that you don't find in the tutorial. And um, uh, and then there's a one in uh, in German. Uh, I think that's I personally I think that's actually the best for for itself. You know, for an independent student, um, Elizabeth Rieken has a Einführung. It, you know, just an introduction. I forgot what the rest of it is, but an introduction to Hittite, basically. And um, uh, I think that's really the, actually the best one if you if you happen to be a person who reads German or is interested in practicing your German, uh, maybe maybe. I'd say that's a fair amount of people who are interested in Indo-European, and I happen to know there are Germans in here, so uh, that could in yeah. fact be quite useful. Uh, how many students do you get in Hittite? Uh, yeah, um, usually I would say uh, but, uh, like around a dozen. Um, if it, you know, I would say is like pretty typical. I'd like to see that number go up a little bit. Uh, I feel like with a little bit of promoting, uh, you know, I didn't really have a chance. To, I mean, I I got to UCLA in. You know, I arrived on back in the United States just before Christmas. I, you know, I got, I started, uh, I got to LA like two days before classes started. And so I didn't have a lot of chance to do that stuff. Um, so I, I get, I get students from both the program and European studies, uh, graduate students and, um, uh, and then undergrads from uh, usually a mixture of things. Like uh, some of them are now coming from ancient Near East where I'm actually, I'm actually in the Near Eastern department now at UCLA. Okay. And uh that's my like, home department, and then I'm in the in depart the interdepartmental program in Indo-European studies, which you mentioned oh, previously. Right. There's only, if I right, there were only like one or two people who were actually like their home thing was Indo-European. Like, was Melcher actually? Like actually, no. None of us are homed in. All of us are. So actually, all of us are fifty. Like everyone who's in it is basically fifty percent in pies uh, and fifty percent okay. in something else. So like. I'm the fifty percent in Near East. Craig with fifty percent in linguistics. Uh, not on the current on the current faculty. It's uh, myself, uh, fifty percent in Near East, and fifty percent in Pies. Um, uh, Brent Fine is just retiring this year. Uh, so, oh. so who actually were? Uh, that's that's the. I would I would normally have said current faculty, but he really just he just left. And uh, Stephanie Jamison, half in uh, Southeast Asian Studies uh, for Sanskrit, and um, uh, and then half in Pies, and uh, and Dave Goldstein in linguistics. So everybody is everybody is split like that. And Brent was half in classics. 
uh, That's a classic. Yeah, mm-hmm. he was, and he yeah. was the person who I wrote to as a freshman in college asking what other Indo-European languages I should study since I had done Latin and Old English and I was doing Greek, and he told me to try Old Norse. So, oh, cool. A, no, that's such... a... He had a strange impact on my life. I I could say strange or I could say enormous. Uh, But it's strange to think that he was the one who uh, suggested that, actually. Um, Yeah. That is wild. I I, I don't think I'd ever heard that heard that story before. And then and then and that's something directed you to this is like pre Georgia before you went to study with Jared. Yeah, I was an undergrad. I was a freshman. It was I was a first semester freshman in college. And uh, I sent a bunch of fan letters to Indo-Europeanists. So like I wrote to him, I wrote to uh, Lehman at University of Texas, I wrote, wrote to uh, Hans Henry Kalk at Illinois. I just wrote these fan letters basically. It was just like, hey, I'm a freshman at so Texas. Cool. I, I don't know, I was a, you know, I was a weird, believe this or not, I was kind of a weird guy. Uh, and uh, so, part of what I was saying was like, Hey, I'm interested in learning all these ancient languages, but there's no one to teach me these things. So what should I do? What kind of resources would you recommend? And Brent Fine wrote me back this very nice message. And he said, Oh, well, you've already done old English. So old Norse should be uh, pretty easy. You can just find Gordon's introduction to old Norse in most big libraries. And uh, mm-hmm. that was uh, pretty impactful. You might say. Yeah, that's Brent's got great advice. He's really he's he's one of a kind. I don't I mean, you know, we're we're in some sense looking to find someone else. I mean, right now we're hoping to be able to run a search soon and, and find someone to to come be our classical linguist in in uh in the program in European studies, but it's you know, no no one can fill those shoes. I mean, it's really it's no. really uh it's very funny, you know, now we're I just as a you know, sort of insider baseball, but like we're trying the amount of stuff that he, he was the one who really knew how the Indo European program and he said he's worked like all of like sure, the, sure. The, the, the the nuts and bolts of it because he's been there, you know, for, for 30 years. And um, uh, and now we're all like, oh my God, we have to, you know, the rest of us are now trying to figure out how to do all of these things that he was quietly taking care of behind the scenes. And, um, oh, and it's yeah. kind of, I hope, I hope it doesn't all go to hell. I think, I think we've got it, but, but with it, with his help, but, but I think it's, uh, yeah, oh, he was but doing I get a lot. Saying. I mean, every program has that guy who actually knows how the program works, and uh, uh, like those guys tend to be the ones who then wind up handling everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it, it is a burden. It's a you know a blessing and a curse or something. If you are one of those you know diligent people who learn the insides the inside out, it's probably mostly a curse. Um, I mean, there's. <laughs> That's right. There's definitely younger classical classicists with an Indo-European background. I mean, uh, you know, in our own cohort or close to our own, my cohort, older than your generation, you know, you're a much younger band. Um, there's Luke Gordon, of course, uh, who actually has been at New Mexico for a long time now. Hey, was that a, is he, uh, he's doing well though. He's, he's like, a, he's there for the long haul. I, I... He's not tenured. So. I don't know. Was it? You ought to go poach him. Yeah. Okay. okay. But, keep that in mind. I remember his thing. He wrote on. He wrote on wine. I remember him yeah. t- talking with him and Greg about it. Uh, I don't know. I don't. The words for wine and their sort of. I don't know. Maybe you did. You even do an interview with him on here? Maybe yeah. possibly. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Okay. We, yeah, yeah, we yeah, talked yeah. about it. It's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, he takes he takes wine as being actually a, a proto Indo European root and. And, you know, like the Germanic and Baltic Slavic words as being native cognates to Latin rather than borrowings from Latin or Greek. Um, mm. It's interesting stuff. I mean, uh, the problem is a root like that, of course, you know, not much happens to Wayne. <laughs> right? I mean, it's like almost manufactured in a lab to be this root that you almost cannot tell if it is a borrowing or a cognate because just not that much happens to that sequence. Oh. Mm. Yeah, it is an odd, an oddly stable one. I, I never, I, you know, it's funny. I don't remember that one kind of being a candidate. So I once saw this. I can't remember where it was, but it was like a list of like Indo-European. Why well, it was? Uh, yeah, it was basically Indo-European words that had undergone the least change from you know, like from the from Proto-Indo-European to the modern languages. And I, I guess I don't remember seeing that on that list. I remember name. Name is one on that list. Yeah. 
uh, you know, at least I guess, you know, sort of having sonorants that are not, that are not, you know, that are not yeah, uh, uh, between vowels, you know, those are, that's really the best way to remain stable for, for all time or something. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, I guess, I guess water, depending on how many branches yeah. you're looking at, water is not a bad one for that fairly stable because isn't the Hittite word like water? Water. Yeah, yeah. it sure is. Yeah, yeah, that's, that is a good, that is a good one. Although, you know, it gets, uh yeah yeah it, i mean some of the languages it's not so not so it, completely transparent but yeah i agree that, yeah. that's another fairly stable but again that w glide at the beginning is like um uh you know th that that's uh th same deal you know it's not a lot going on there so something I mean, you know you have to change the normal change of w to v in lots of places but um but you know it still looks the same basically yeah i like to think that you know if i were starving and or dying of thirst in Anatolia, you know, 1500 BC, I could have shouted for water, water, and someone might have understood me. Yeah, uh, definitely. That that's a huge advantage, a huge survival advantage. Who knew? It it truly is for you know time travel purposes, which I I really lose sleep about my my time travel survival strategies. Uh, I need to work on my survival hits a little bit more. I would need so, to work on all the survival skills. I mean, really, I don't have virtually any i you know i had the embarrassment of just barely you know trying to trying to well i'm getting better at it but i've been practicing making fires this summer and it was really embarrassingly terrible at the beginning i was just like i would be in the, i mean it's one of those things where you don't it's like you know i just didn't realize how how much i'd be in the weeds if uh until you actually sit down and try to to do these basic uh basic oh. survival element well there's that jack london story to build a fire right i I think I actually made the fires in Idlewild. Now that I'm thinking about it, because I know we definitely had wasn't me. <laughs> well, definitely wasn't me. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, note to self: I need, if I need to dispose of you, I'll just drop you off in the woods somewhere. Uh, well, so one thing you brought to my attention, or I, I've been hearing about this, but I hadn't seen the paper and just sat down and read it. Was this new paper published? Was it in Science? Yeah, yeah, big splash. Every every few years, you get one of these big splashy ones in science or nature with like a zillion co-authors uh, yeah, about the indigo. Was a zillion. Yeah, um, and I, I was like, I was actually going through the uh, co-author list to, to see who all I knew, and uh, it's like Ronald Kim. This guy shows up in the, like everywhere, <laughs> but um. Yeah, yeah. It, it's funny. I, I completely missed Ron, Ron in there, but yeah, Ron's Ron's around. Yeah. Um. So this paper combined uh, linguistics, uh, archaeology, and uh, the rapidly expanding field of uh, is the term paleogenetics. Is that you know? I'm not in the field. So I don't know what they. Call, yeah, I think you can call it that. But again, I'm not like. You know, a DNA, ancient DNA. Ancient DNA. I guess you could yeah. call it paleogenetics, but uh, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, I, you never know with these like what they, what the what the specialists prefer. But um, uh, but yeah, I, yeah, yeah. And I mean, obviously, it's sort of a sensitive thing, like what you call it and and how you use it, um, because you know, weirdos on the internet get all kinds of bizarre notions. Um, but a pretty interesting paper pushing back, uh, according to the co-authors, the putative date of Proto-Indo-European to way before linguists have typically put it. Uh, yeah, that's right. About about two two thousand years, uh, roughly, uh, set back from the sort of standardly accepted dates for for Proto-Indo-European. Um, yeah, or at least what yeah what you know what all linguists have believed for a long time now, and have, I think been pretty pretty widely accepted since you know for the last at least the last 15 years yeah and uh also uh claim support for the notion of uh proto-european including hittite uh having been spoken south of the caucasus that's the idea yeah, that's the that is the that is the proposal here which is i mean in some way it's some sense it's not wildly different from the uh sort of from the traditional uh 
farming hypothesis view. It's kind of like so you know right. So we have the the two the two kind of classical hypotheses, which they actually have very nice. Uh, people should check out this article just because it has very nice little cute diagrams, kind of summarizing the uh, the the major views on this. So they you know the original the sort of the the step hypothesis in its classic form. So that would be the you know originating on the Pontic Caspian steppe north of the Black Sea, uh, or yeah around six around well they would say six thousand before present. Uh, so four thousand BCE or whatever, and uh, and then the farming hypothesis, which would be which would push it back like another three three thousand thirty five hundred years further back, and that would be out of out of Anatolia, um, but uh, but or or maybe Anatolia adjacent. I mean, again, I I'm I'm sort of looking right now actually at the the maps in their paper, and uh, the homeland ends up looking basically like the same, or very close to or the same as the the places where we. Where the the farming hypothesis would have situated it, so like, I don't know. It's kind of like yeah, south of the Caucasus, east of the the you know the 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 Anatolian Peninsula, uh, kind of in the I don't know, in, pretty close to like modern Armenia. <laughs> like that's that's kind right. of the yeah, that's the kind yeah. of gist of it. And, and as an Anatolianist, what do you think of this? What's what's your take on their use of the evidence and their conclusions? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting. I, so as an, yeah, so, well, I mean, as an Indo-Europeanist, all of us linguists are extremely unhappy about this. Like we liked the idea that we were all, this is, <laughs> so, uh, I talked to Russell Gray about this. He came and presented an early version of this paper at the UCLA and European conference, uh, for your listener, for your listeners. It's, uh, we run this into European conference every, every fall at UCLA, um, free and open to the public, people should come. And, um, uh, and we have gotten better, I think, about streaming the talks. If not, if it have, if it haven't moved, we moved it to all streaming for a little while. I forgot what we did last year, but I'm hoping to run it all streaming this year as well. So, anyway, cool. I'll just say that I had a chance to talk to to Russell Gray, who's one of the main people behind this new uh, this new study. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> He told me, so he, he's also one of the people who were, uh, is associated with the sort of the original farming hypothesis. So he was, you know, he wrote some of these papers that, uh, you know, doing early work in phylogenetics that led support, he said, he claimed to the, to the farming hypothesis. Uh, and uh, at the time he, he spoke to, uh, <laughs> he, he, he was talking with Andrew Garrett, who's one of an Indo-European linguist and is associated with the, with the big paper that came before this one, basically, that argued uh, a 2015 paper in language that argued that, you know, the, the using phylogenetics with so-called ancestry constraints to show that the, the date for the Proto-European, uh, the Proto-European uh, unity and so, so forth, the hand, uh, also so then the homeland was more like 6,000, 4,000 4, BC or so, which was the date that a linguist really liked. So so he and, he and Andrew are talking about this and Andrew said something like uh, way back then, or, you know, in advance of the publication, there's something like, you know, I don't know why, uh, why your analyses uh, aren't right. I'm not sure why your analyses aren't right, but, um, uh, but I'm sure that they're not right. <laughs> and I kind of feel the same. I said this, I said, like, I said the same thing to Russell at the covers in the fall. It seems very hard to, it's very hard to swallow because basically it, 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 it's hard to follow as a linguist, and, and a lot of this is impressionistic, as they say in the paper. But basically, what what, happen, what, what happens when you have this earlier date for Proto-European, or is is you uh, have this long period in which the languages seem like they don't change very much at all. It just, I mean, it, you know, if so, so maybe maybe I should back up just a little. Bit. I should say when I'm reading like Hittite and when I'm reading Vedic Sanskrit, these are like two very early attested old representatives of the family. Once you get past like the the very different scripts and stuff, God, the grammar of these things feels so similar. The grammar and the morphology, it just looks it it, you know, after you they they just feel very familiar in a way that uh, in a way that doesn't feel like these have been uh, diverging for you know many thousands of years on this on this uh, on this earlier dating, and so you know imp impressionistically as a linguist, it feels like. Well, we find the the languages. I mean, once we get the attested records of these languages, they then change. It, we watch them changing in real time, and they look like they're changing quite quickly. 
And so it, it's just hard to imagine that the prehistory before that was characterized by so, so much stability that, that you kind of need for things to end up as similar looking as they do when they first show up in the historical record. So so as a linguist, it's it's very, at least to me as a linguist, as a linguist, it, it feels it feels very hard to believe, but that said, like they're, you know, it's a very fancy study. They they worked really really hard to build this uh, improved uh, improved database uh, of, of of the lexicon and tried to you know code these things in a quite careful and precise way. And and uh, uh, yeah, and, and I guess so. That so then there's the other side of this. There's like the you know so as a linguist, it feels it feels hard to. It feels a little bit hard to swallow. And then I think the archaeologists are kind of my impression from talking to some of this that they're kind of unhappy also. Uh, because this doesn't really then converge neatly with like we don't have evidence, really good evidence for uh, an Indo-European like culture at this early date in that area. So mm -hmm. this is like why. You know, this is why people were very happy about the, I mean, archaeologists and linguists were happy with the 6000 BCE date in the steppes. It's like well, we have evidence for uh, an you know an archaeological culture. The, the you know people talk about the Yamnaya that like that seem Indo-European like, and they're there at the right time, and they are sort of plausible candidates for having spoken Indo-European. Uh, and so th th these two things kind of fit together. And now under this new thing, kind of nothing quite fits together. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so it's going to be a lot of, I think there's going to be a lot of debate about how we can, I, I don't know, you know, kind of make these things work. I mean, maybe this will spur new archaeological research, will turn up new things. That's, that's the, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really know. That's kind of outside of my expertise. But, um, but it's definitely, it throws, throws up some big wrenches into uh, our traditional understanding of, of these things. Yeah, I, I agree with the points you're making there. And, and, uh a couple of the thoughts that occurred to me, you know, as I was going through the paper, uh, a word kept coming to my mind that never got used in the paper. And that was glottochronology. I kind of yeah. felt like part of what I was looking at was like a neo glottochronology. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, well, we're all trying to do these rates of change, right? We're all trying to figure out what, the, you know, the, this try to understand. Yeah, I mean, the, right, a lot of chronology, fan, older name for like trying to understand rates of rates of rates of linguistic change, and you know, there's no perfect answer to these things. Um, they, you know, they're trying to uh, do. They're, they're trying to take on this problem computationally, and it is it is in there. So when you have like, you know, when you have, uh, uh, you know, for some of the younger, for some of the, you know, not the early early stages of the branches, but the you know the younger languages. I mean, we can sort of you can identify like historical points at which they can't you, you can you know you can build this into the model right like you know this language can't have been spoken any earlier than than blah 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 because it's a descendant of, of such and such um uh so you know th they're they're trying to work this all out computationally and you know i, I don't know I don't, I don't know if there's a neat situation but i guess this it's sort of this yeah sort of working back around to the thing I was saying before is that it does feel like when this earlier date is is present you like you have again this these I feel impressionistically it feels like you have these long periods of stability where these languages had to have remained unchanged kind of similar to Proto-European as we reconstruct it for a very long time and so the you know then then all of a sudden we actually get the attested languages and like I don't know you know for someone who works on Hittite it's like old Hittite is considerably different than new Hittite. There's a lot of like really noticeable innovations in just a couple hundred of years. And and I think this is basically true in any language that any language family were, you know, any of the sort of older stages of the languages as we can observe them. Uh, you know, Homeric Greek is significantly different from classical Greek in in and in in really pr pretty dramatic ways, at least to my mind. So it's like um uh I don't know. You know, it, it's it just it feels it feels uh, unsatisfying. And you mentioned how different Homeric Greek is from Classical Greek, but then Homeric Greek also looks so much more like Vedic Sanskrit or Avestan. And it's really mm. surprising how far back this paper pushes the, the, the Avestan-Sanskrit split and the Indo-Iranian versus Greek split. I mean, it makes Indo-Iranian and Greek yeah. not even close. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but impressionistically, 
Homeric Greek is so much like Sanskrit. Well, it's like, this is the morphology. It's like in the morphology, these languages all look so incredibly similar. And, uh, and, uh, and I mean, to some extent, the phonology too, but really the morphology is just like, you know, there's this extremely rich set of complicated morphology that's all shared by, um, by yeah. you know, basically by Greek and by Indo-Iranian. And it's, it's just, it, I don't know, this, it doesn't feel like we have a satisfactory uh, answer for that. Let me say, and uh, related to that is another th interesting thing about another strange, I mean, to my mind, strange thing about this paper. So in the European subgrouping, there's like very little that people agree on, like, you know, and how you, how you, you know, what, beyond that we agree that these all come from Proto-European, there's like a lot of disagreement, but like there's one point, there's like one, I teach this like the first day of, you know, first day of intro to Indo-European linguistics. And there's like one thing we all agree on. And that is that uh, uh, Anatolian went off first. You have Proto-European, Anatolian went off, and then everything else forms a clade to the exclusion of Anatolian. And an interesting thing is that this analysis, the new paper, it actually just doesn't get that. It, it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't set up a common, uh, a common ancestor of everything that's not Anatolian, which is, striking let's say so right. Right. I, I i hope i hope i don't sound like i'm too negative about this study i'm not i just it's no. just like there are some things that it's very surprising as a linguist to you know as an indo european historical linguist like to encounter uh to see in this um to see in this analysis and that to me is really one of them that's like i don't know you know we talked last time about i think the you know the emergence of the feminine gender as like a really important nuclear indo-european innovation on the morphological side, of course, remember this, these studies all deal with lexical data, but it's like, it looks like a big one. <laughs> it's like a big grammatical, big grammatical, you know, change. And, yeah. and it's not, uh, it doesn't, it really just doesn't get that in this model. So I, I, that, that's a striking, that's a striking feature. And it's so, I mean, you know, when you have com, common feminine formants between Old Norse and Sanskrit, I mean, like this is, a mm. new, as you said, it is a nuclear Indo-European development. This isn't like a coincidence. And I mean, that's yeah. a central insight of historical linguistics is that these things aren't coincidences. Um, mm. but, but then you have the paper also, you know, like, okay, so we don't get this nuclear Indo-European clade out of the paper, but then it, it proposes pretty strongly a Germanic Celtic Italic clade. And I'm like, morphologically, yeah. what does Germanic have in common with Celtic and Italic? You know, nothing in particular. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's, that is a weird one where the morphology doesn't. Yeah, I agree that those don't those don't fit together neatly. I mean, there is there's lots of evidence that people cite for like a Western Indo-European, and and then the question. So like, yeah, so all of those are kind of these Indo-European languages that kind of ended up at the the Western edge of the Indo-European world. And there's always been this thing about how there's always I mean there's always been debate about how to explain their commonalities, even when there are these sort of morphological divergences, some of which are, are harder to assess because of the late the later adaptation of, of those of those branches. But but like there's always this everybody agrees that there are some set of features that bring together uh, some of these Western Indo-European languages. And then there's the question of whether that has something to do with like convergence or really really some some uh, whether this is associated with a particular node on the tree, right? So like, you know, are these people just the ones who kind of were wandering westward and kind of bumped into each other again and again as they ended up, you know, uh, uh, as they sort of made their way across the, the Indo-European world. Well, and, and you've got, you know, there, something that's, I think, difficult to to reconcile between linguistic evidence and and especially genetic, but also to some extent archaeological evidence is just the extent to which languages can split and then re, you know, seed one another, right? Yeah, Which, right. It's, yeah, that's a nice way of just trying. Yeah, of a much a much nicer way of saying what I was trying to say. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And here I, I'm going to go into the comments here where I see some people have had some questions. Is that you while we're on this subject? So, um, B. Yavorsky asks, isn't there also a lot of shared vocabulary that shouldn't be shared uh, with that earlier date? I guess they're claiming borrowing or parallel formations uh, technology-wise, like copper and Bronze Age uh, vocabulary. That does kind of come up in the paper, right? 
like they, they point out that wheel, for example, is a shared vocabulary item, but then they kind of like write this off that everything meant something else. Um, These languages are splitting uh, well, up the, for the, the wheel. The wheel thing, the, the problem, it's the, the wheel is a famous one where Anatolian has, does not have the same vocabulary item as the, uh, as the, as the nuclear Indo European, as the other non Anatolian Indo European languages. Uh, they do, there is some, there is some question of loan words that comes up in this. Like where, where do, where do various kinds of loan words come from? Um, uh, yeah, I don't, So, so maybe uh, I feel like I missed a little bit of the question. Uh, that you should be able to see it in the chat. Um, yeah, isn't there a lot of shared vocabulary that shouldn't be shared with the earlier dates? That's actually that's a good question, and I haven't. I'm trying to think. Yeah, that's a good question, and I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know the answer to. It. I haven't. I haven't thought about. I haven't thought about that. I don't know. I, I'm trying to think of what that would be. Like, what would we expect to be? Uh, what would we expect to be shared? Maybe the listener can. Maybe the commenter can add what they're uh, uh, something they have a little more specific in mind, and we could follow up on it. But I can't. Yeah, I don't have a great answer for this. Well, I'm trying to think of technological vocabulary that is present hypothetically in a nuclear PIE. I mean, wheel. copper or some kind of ore um right well this yolk. doesn't change yeah uh, well so this doesn't the thing is it doesn't rad so the the uh let me think yeah you well you would still expect because they have this early split off of anatolian you still expect these to be innovated separately yeah right okay uh, all right i see i see right so so maybe we would expect uh disagreements in like wheeled vehicle terminology uh because wheeled vehicles don't show up in the historical right i mean we don't have you know yeah we don't have yeah, yeah right okay yeah okay i think i think i understand the question now right so yeah you right so like so some of the technology uh, items that we see developing should post date the nuclear into european split on this new dating yeah i don't i don't know uh whether that really gets addressed at least i don't see any uh i don't i i didn't see i don't remember or see any discussion uh right now as i'm kind of scanning it of that particular problem it's a really interesting one though and uh, uh yeah, i'm gonna leave it for like the sort of the material culture people to to fight it out but i, I do, do think that's an interesting point right so like right so like on the on the lower chronology we just expect this split in wheel terminology with anatolian but on the on the earlier chronology that they're proposing, we might also expect the other Indo-European languages, leaving Anatolian aside to disagree with respect to some of these, you know, these uh, uh, these things that we think are sort of innovations uh, at a later historical point of uh, technology items. So, so yeah, that, that's really cool and interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, and it's really surprising to me that you would postulate that, you know, the common ancestor of Indo-Iranian and Germanic would have split up before the wheel, and yet the word for wheel is cognate in Germanic and Indic. You know, like, where are they talking <laughs> that they're sharing the same word at some point in the middle there? Yeah, that's an interesting, that's that's an interesting observation. I, I suspect that people will, I, I, there, there's going to be pushback, I think, I mean, on this, and, uh, and uh, as I said, I, I think that linguists don't, find it we'll find this a hard pill to swallow they certainly did to judge from the you know impressions at, at the, our, our conference this fall and this past fall and uh and and the and the archaeologists too uh so so you know uh you know it's going to be they'll, they'll definitely not uh you know there will be a lot an interesting dialogue that emerges from this uh, the only people who you know in some ways like the only thing that their that their article that their proposal does arguably fit with is the is the new adna stuff Which and even there, like this one, this is one we, where we should talk about because this is one where the Anatolian evidence is kind of important. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like they, they, they there's this idea that um, uh, so basically what we find in when we look at Anatolia, we don't find a really big uh, it, we we look at the evidence that's available the ADNA evidence that's available for Anatolia 
uh, what we don't find is uh, evidence for uh, you know, uh, you know, basically a DNA, the, the sort of the DNA signature that matches the, the, you know, the, the traditional, um, like step hypothesis, you know, so we don't find, uh, we don't find the DNA that's associated with that complex in Anatolia. And so this is why, you know, you might, so th basically they use this then as evidence to say, okay, well, well, you know, instead they have, what we do find is, uh, shoot, I have to, I'd have to, Whoa. uh, look up what they call it but basically you find this uh, uh, dna that's associated more with like the area south of the caucasus that ends up that that's what we find in anatolia right so there's uh, no so, there's no genetic evidence for this vast step migration to anatolia at the time right exactly but the that at, at, at the time is the really important is the really important one so right so actually what do we have to actually base this on and the answer is not that much so basically, so like by the time, uh, by the, so we have really good evidence. So we have a pretty good data pool of ADNA evidence that comes from uh, Anatolia, including places where we know that there were Indo-European speakers uh, starting in the, uh, it, you know, like much later, like much way after the second, you know, way after the late Bronze Age, basically. So like, you know, in, in the, in the, in the first millennium BCE and, uh, and, uh, there we don't find uh, right, any evidence for this um, uh, for you know for step for a step mi for migration from the steps. But the question is like, well, I mean, if if you if if there had really been a migration for that, could it just have gotten kind of swallowed up by the native populations? You know, like is this just something that we wouldn't detect anyway? And uh, and this is something where. I think when we have more evidence, but so, you know, what we really would like to have is, uh, is uh, people from a much earlier date. Like we would like to okay. have human remains that, you know, ADNA evidence from a much, much earlier point. And there are just a few data points that exist in that, that are, I think, included in their analysis that come from a much, much earlier period. I think even before the late, it's if they predate the late bronze age. I can't remember how far back they go. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, for them, that's, I mean, it's good for them that they don't that those don't show any evidence of step ancestry. But but in fact, the big problem with these data points, and I've talked about this with some other you know hypologists and people who specialize in this, uh, people like um, Petra Hudekober at University of Chicago is really interested in this question. It, what we what we do, the problem is that these early remains they don't come from anywhere we near where we are sure that there are Indo-European speakers at the time. So like what we really need here to to be clear is like what we really need is some kind of ADNA evidence that comes from like in and around Hattusa around the time we think that the Hittites were there at the beginning you know like that's kind of what we really need and that doesn't exist at the moment but it's supposed to come it's supposedly going to arrive and it will be really interesting to see what the results are when when it does I'll be very interested in that and you know I think that also we're in danger as as the ADNA revolution really takes off here, there's a it, it's an amazing tool, but there's a danger of saying, here's this great new tool that suggests these new ideas, these wipe out earlier ideas, right? It has to be kind of synthesized with data from linguistics and archeology span in a way that I think sometimes it's most excited proponents don't do. Um, and one thing I was yeah. thinking about with that was actually in this very paper, the authors were talking about like, well, what's the, what is the correct genetic quote tracer dye to use for Indo-European? Because mm. that's part of the question here is like, well, is the correct genetic tracer dye for Indo-European actually present in Anatolia and it's not the step DNA. But part of what occurred to me as I'm reading this is if you're talking, if you can't figure out what the genetic tracer dye for the language is, maybe that means there isn't consistently a genetic tracer dye before it. it isn't consistently spreading by one population moving that language, right? Other populations somewhere are picking up this language. That could be that actually step people are picking up the language that didn't originate on the step. That's that's a possibility too. Um, mm -hmm. But it could also very much mean, like you said, that in Anatolia, you know, maybe a smaller step population has been overwhelmed by an Anatolian population and just there's not that much genetic trace of that step population anymore. Yeah, that, that is certainly right. Yeah. For that latter possibility, I'll just say that 
if you go, one of the papers that really feeds this uh, paper is just a, a paper from a, like a roughly a year, um, and maybe it was 2022. Yeah, 2022. Uh, this is like David Reich at hours out of the David Reich lab at Harvard. And they, you know, they have this, uh, it's, it was also in science and it was called the genetic history of the Southern Arc, a bridge between West Asia and Europe. And this is, so basically at the, the, the end of the paper, they have this hypothesis A, you know, <laughs> Where, where, which, uh, they have these two hypotheses, A and B, and one of them involves, yeah, like, you know, an Indo European mi migration to Anatolia that got swallowed up by the native population, which is totally, totally possible. Uh, to my mind, like, this, if you just take the, if the, you know, the story of the Hittites' rise to power in, in, you know, in central Anatolia in the second millennium BC is like one of these, like, accident, accident stories. Like, you know, this, it, 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 there's very much the impression that, like, you have this small group that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of rose up to, you know, a sort of uh, suddenly and unpredictably. I mean, it's, you know, it's as surprising as the ascendancy of, of Rome, you know, uh, in, in Italy, to my mind. And, uh, you know, as opposed to any of the other much bigger, you know, the much bigger population, but, you know, say even Italic speaking populations or Etruscans or so on uh, all around them, these kind of uh, fancier, more more sort of uh, uh, well-established uh, um, uh you know, kingdoms. Uh, so anyway, all I'll just say is that I, I wouldn't be at all surprised by the just, you know, DNA getting just kind of swallowed up by, uh, by the, by the, by the native population. And, 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 you know, that's certainly one of the possibilities that Reich, the Reich paper uh, talks about. And then the other hypothesis is the one that, that they're, that they're endorsing in this, uh, in the new article. They're like, oh, this is the one where, you know, you have all of this south of the Caucasus uh, DNA uh, because they, you know, that's where the Indo Europeans split. They, they ended, you know, they split off to Anatolia, and then, you know, then they migrated to the steppe. And th that's why they're calling this thing a hybrid hypothesis. By the way, that you know, the idea is it it involves the steppe hypothesis, but it involves an initial migration across the Caucasus that doesn't include Anatolia. Yeah, and of course, another thing we have to keep in mind is: are we mismatching uh, linguistic origins with genetic origins? Because, you know, you could reconstruct. I mean, mm. whoever the population who spoke Proto-Indo-European was, they had ancestors, right? So, like, yeah, they came from somewhere. <laughs> so, like, but are, mm. are are we hitting the same level in linguistics as, as they're hitting in genetics, right? Yeah, Is no, the, uh, that's what I'm saying. Is this the question? And I, you know, so if I see a question here and you're saying, do you think paleogenetics is anything worthwhile insights to contribute traditional style linguistics. And I think the answer is like, absolutely, yes. But like, you kind of have to do them both at the same time, I think, you know, like we can only make the lingua, you know, we can all, we're, we're sort of, uh, you know, we can make these reasonable linguistic hypotheses to account for linguistic facts and then kind of fitting them together with evidence for ADNA and then of course, archaeology as well. It's like this, it, it has to be the, the, the puzzle pieces, they, they can't be separated. And I, I do, I do worry a little bit about this new paper kind of separating them a little bit. All we have for basically this, uh, this, this one, this model that, it, that is built on linguistic data, but this, of this particular kind, and then possible convergence with some ADNA, but if without at least archaeology kind of filling in the, uh, filling in, you know, doing its, doing its fundamental sort of, you know, third piece supporting this, it's like, I, I don't know. It doesn't. It, it just. It's. It's going to need that if it's going to gain any any wide currency. I think. Yeah. Uh, by the way, you mentioned Reich, and uh, I should put in a good word for his book, um, "Who We Are and How We Got Here." I think that's what it's called. That was the first so introduction. Called. Yeah, that that was the first introduction I had to to the new ADNA field, and uh, I found it very informative and. Uh, and I thought responsible in its use of all the evidence that he talked about. Um, I thought it was a good book. Yeah, I would second that, and also say um, uh, he he's he's also quite a good and clear speaker. And I think you can find a bunch of his uh, material on YouTube. Like he gives very good, uh, I don't know, very very good, very clear talks where, um, uh, where you know, they're also uh, a way. I think he's very honest about like, you know, about, about the, the, the uncertainties in, 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 in all of this. And I don't know, I just always found him, uh, you know, I come away feeling, uh, uh, you know, like I've learned something every time, I, every time I hear him talk. Yeah. And, uh, I think that he also is very aware of, uh, 
how people of certain persuasions want to misuse this stuff and gets ahead of it, right? He's he's very clear about you know the limits of this evidence and uh, and of the uh, ideological deductions you could make from it. Um, anyway, mm. I, I've appreciated his his writing on the subject. Mm. Um, let's see, there have been some other questions in here. Let me see. Some of these may have been kind of obviated by some of this discussion so far. Davis had asked, do y'all think the study would go so far as to basically confirm some of the arguments people put forward against linguistic paleontology in general? Um, there may be people who think so, but I don't think so. Nah. <laughs> and uh, also mentioned that Coke has recently released a book on Italo, Italic with Celtic with Germanic. I haven't looked at that, but that's interesting. Um, I've always thought that Italo-Celtic was a fairly reasonable uh, idea. I don't know about throwing Germanic in there because Germanic is so morphologically different from them, right? I mean, the, the mm. dative is the dative is different. There's no trace of that R passive in Germanic, um, mm. which is is old, even if it's you know only showing up really in Italic and Celtic and I guess Tocharian. Um, yeah, maybe residually elsewhere. There's um, a lot of phonological convergence for but it's but i mean sorry I should, maybe I, i've already kind of given away the game by calling it convergence it looks to me like convergence anyway i think to most people too there's a lot of phonological similarity between i don't know the, the way that the sort of i don't know for instance the european stop system is treated going into uh into um uh, germanic and, and into celtic but that that looks like convergence type phenomena of you know of, yeah. of contact oh yeah uh, i mean you can have aerial vocabulary which there obviously is between Western branches, and, and I'll loop Balto Slavic into there. You can have aerial um, phonological conversions, and I think to some minor degree, you can have aerial morphological uh, conversions. I mean, the the perfect mm -hmm. using the verb have is basically shared by Italic and Germanic, and I think that you can call that aerial spread, right? That's Maybe that's a hard one because it's, it's it's also like a cross, cross linguistically super like Hittite does that too. So, so oh, does it? Uh, okay. I didn't. Yeah. I see. Uh, I but, 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 no, your point, another, another good example is like something like the augment, right? Like mm. in you know, uh, like that's such a you know, it's it's every, everything right there. You know, fr Phrygian, Greek, uh, uh, Armenian, uh, and uh, why am I forgetting the last one? But anyway, but the, the point is it. It's it's an Iranian, yeah, right. Indo -Iranian. <laughs> Indo -Iranian. Yeah. That's, uh, the yeah. big one, yeah, 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 right, right, right. Well, yeah, uh, of course, very marginal in uh, in in Avesta and so on, but yeah, certainly there. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, uh, someone said in here at the bottom that you know we're kind of talking about this right now. Are there sort of these questions where paleogenetic stuff could be really uh, cool and interesting? And I do think one of the answers there is, is kind of the stuff we're talking about now, which is like. Can it? Can we? As we get more data, and it's really coming out so quickly now. I mean, it's really um, kind of kind of stunning. You know, is some of these lower order uh, questions? So, so we'll, like, you know, all of these are very hard. So, all, all of these questions of what are Indo-European subgroups beneath that? What we what I call that nuclear European level. These are really the super hard questions. Although now this new paper is, of course, opening up the the one at the top again, which is. To the frustration, I'm sure, of every, all the linguists who've been struggling with the other one. At any rate, my feeling is that uh, some of those, uh, you know, um, what is the inner filiation of Indo-European, uh, you know, uh, within uh, leaving aside Anatolian, I feel like some of the ADNA evidence here is going to be really um, crucial, and uh, uh, so I think that that'll be cool and interesting to see how it uh, interesting. It might give you some better get a better sense of like sort of t time depths for these uh, for some of these uh, for some of these you know, talking about proto italo celtic or so on. Uh, also, well, in, on the subject of proto italo I just want to plug the, Michael Weiss has a nice, nice, very even-handed treatment of this problem. And I think it was the volume that someone mentioned already in the chat. I think it's in that, uh, 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 Christensen, Cronin, Villaslev, the Indo-European Puzzle I Revisited. I think it's in that one, although there was another one that came out with Brill right around the same time, and it could be in there. I, I, I'm sure I can. I'm sure the reference can be uh, dug up. But it's Michael Weiss on a Tal Celtic. That would, that's that's what you're interested in. Okay. Or if yeah, you're interested in the problem, that's what you should be interested in. <laughs> well, I I think these questions of the subgrouping really are interesting and, and really difficult. And it it reminds me actually just last night, um, 
I was talking with a bunch of drunk paleontologists and, um, you know, we were, <laughs> it's, you know, uh, hashtag. Y'all just Jackson. get together for, get yes, together we do. for. Hashtag Jackson Crawford life. And um, there was this debate that opened up between them about some of these classification questions. And I was really reminded of some linguistic classification questions where, and, and I'm, I'm slandering them by calling them all drunks, but, you know, just, just having fun with it. But um, like you can say, okay, these are stegosaurs. These are ankylosaurs, right? These animals share certain features that, you know, they're obviously more closely related than they are to other animals. But how do you subgroup these things? It's really, really tough when all you've got is skeletal features. You know, you don't have the you don't have genetics for these animals. And I thought mm. to myself, this is a lot like, and I, and I brought this up with them, this is a lot like working with ancient languages where, you know, you can't hear them, right? Mm -hmm. And you can't, like, you know, rewind the clock to see whose father, you know, is from whose father is from. Like, you, you're just working with these basically skeletal remains of languages. And it is really tough to subgroup. Like, you can say, okay, this is a Germanic language. This is a Celtic language. How exactly are these connected within this broader Indo-European family? It's, it's kind of tough because, you know, like my impression from morphology, to some extent from lexical stuff, to some extent from archaeological stuff, is that if Germanic is closer to any other branch, it's Baltic Slavic. But, mm -hmm. you know, there's also a lot impressionistically that's really different between Germanic and Baltic Slavic. Um, and, you know, this recent paper makes it look like there's, you know, not that much, especially close there. Um, and I don't know if there's any particular genetic evidence uh, for a close link there. Yeah, I, I think you're going to get different evidence from different branches and you're going to have to kind of weigh things and say, well, hey, if archaeology and linguistics paint one picture and genetics paints a different one, then something different is going on with the genetics of this population than is going on with people learning a language. I mean, you look at the USA, what is going to be the tracer die a thousand years ago for people from, you know, 21st century USA? There's going to be nothing because I mean, like, what is, what do we genetically share in common? Um, mm -hmm. But we are, but we are a distinct population and we do have a distinct yeah. language and a distinct culture. So these things don't go together necessarily, even in the ancient world. And in fact, in a lot of ways, the ancient world might be more complicated than our world because people might learn a new language fairly rapidly if there's you know, a, a conquest event or, or a famine that forces two populations together or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree. I don't know how I've, <laughs> I suspect that, you know, geneticists have thought about this question and, and that would, would have some neat answer to tell you about how they would get that, you know, how they would approach, you know, the, the modern parallel that you suggested, but I, I don't know how to do it. It sounds hard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm very interested to find out, like I, I, I mean, like you said, this is moving so fast. There's so many papers, and not having that hard science background, you know, I can't interpret all of this data particularly well. But uh, you know, I think that that field has a lot to contribute. I just think that we also have to avoid thinking of it as the be all end all, or as being somehow like, you know, um, super evidence over you know less valuable archaeological or linguistic evidence. It's all part of trying to reach that picture of the past. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, another question I get in the commentary here, uh, B. Oborska asks uh, what we think about Indo-European relations to other families like Uralic and Semitic and how it might fit in with these articles. Yeah. Uh, you know, you'll have to, this would be an interesting question to ask someone who really knows a lot about Uralic, but it this is, <laughs> you know, just impressionistically, this is, this is moving the <laughs> moving the Indo-European homeland away from uh, away from Uralic, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, the idea that then there are you know that Uralic is you know uh, sort of you have you know a proto Indo-Uralic or something as a you know if the time depth there would have to be, I mean, unless you know I, I don't yeah it seems like it would it, it seems bad for that um, for that uh for that camp but maybe they have some neat fix to solve it I've, i haven't thought too seriously uh, about the Uralic question there is some discussion here of um uh in the paper i think of some of uh of indo-european loanwords into Uralic that come in by indo-iranian and how this uh i think this th there was uh it it if i remember right i think it complicates that too mm -hmm. uh 
Well, I think it, it makes it hard. I, I, well, I, maybe not. Maybe it maybe it helps that I don't know because this th then there's this very you know the idea is that these words are indo iranian -y looking I think and that you know so they're you know you that the idea is that they came into Uralic via indo iranian and uh, yeah I, I I don't know there's there's I, you know there are some real there are some real there are some folks out there who who really uh, spend a lot of time thinking hard about that sort of question and uh, I'm not one of them so um, so you know. Uh, I should leave that. I should leave it to the experts. Yeah, I mean, having about as many qualifications to talk about it, which is to say, not many. Um, I would say that if we're just using um, hashtag facts and logic, um, Uralic came from the south at some point, right? Like, th there is some movement north that brings Uralic to where it is now. I think that this yeah. leaves. Nothing about this leaves leaves out the possibility that some Uralic language is being spoken further south than we think of Uralic speakers being now. Um, but I still think if there's any argument for Indo-European having a higher level connection with another family, the best arguments are for Uralic. Um, I don't think that it's a closed case, mm. but the best argumentation that I've seen for higher level connections is with your rally. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I just wonder how much of that is just, I, I, not that I don't disagree with it. I mean, I don't, you know, certainly it doesn't, you know, so, there's virtually no similar, I mean, so, someone suggests something about Semitic similarities. I, I don't really see anything significant um, there. Uh, so in, in that sense, yeah, it looked like a way better contender. Your would be a way better contender um, uh, than some of the alternatives. But I, I just wonder, you know, how much of that is just, you know, these are the languages that are kind of, you know, it's hard to know how much of this is just aerial stuff. Um, you know, these are the languages, these are the major, the major, you know, mega families that are spoken in, in Europe, basically. So, uh, well, I don't know. And I, I don't know. It's a, yeah, it's an interesting question. And, and another thing that came to my mind uh, in, in this whole discussion with the paleontologist last night is they were, they were saying, well, one, one problem that you actually have pretty often in paleontology is you wind up with sister taxa that are at roughly the same stratum and one is way more basal than the other, right? One is, has much, many more derived features and that more basal sister taxa has just as long of an ancestry, right? Uh, so this can complicate your picture of like what's, where the relative ages are. Um, you know, you might have something like uh, this is all good. This is getting a little bit airy. Let's say that Uralic is closer to whatever that basal Indo Uralic was, if that existed. You mm -hmm. might never quite figure out where that, where the ancestor of the two w was with like glotto chronological type, you know, rate of change methods, because actually one has changed in a very different rate than the other. And, and the mm -hmm. ancestor language is, is completely freaking laws. Um, you know, if there is a proto Indo Uralic or proto Indo whatever, it's like fifteen thousand years ago. So how do you find that? Is that true? I yeah, I don't know what the like the the experts where they where they put the uh, the the common ancestor of these things. I mean, it's obviously a much harder question than with the European, where I don't know. It's like you know, you sometimes you think about. I mean, I thought about it a little bit when I worked on American languages, where it's like you doing you know what would what would it be like to do indo european if we didn't have the old stages of the languages available yeah. to do linguistic construction on and the answer is i don't know it seems really super hard and and yeah like i said we sort of do this in in american studies a lot and uh uh and yeah i don't know you know my impression is it's really hard you know you have to get we think that the proto languages are often of similar similar depth to proto european um uh, and, but, but without those earlier, without, you know, without the really early stages of testing of any of really any of the languages, uh, then it just becomes extremely hard to say things precisely. I mean, if we didn't have like, you know, Vedic Sanskrit and Hittite, and, you know, we would be, we would be in the weeds. Yeah. I think that's an excellent comparandum. Um, you know, you look at Algonquian and, mm you know, Northeastern Algonquian languages versus Arapaho and Cheyenne. It's like Hindi versus German and English. 
You know, mm. like that, that's that's just barely reconstructable. I remember, I, th I feel like I saw relatively recent estimates for the time depth there. And I feel like, yeah, it's not wildly different from, from, from Indo-European. I mean, it's, you know, you really, but you, again, going way, 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 way further back than the earliest records, just, you know, just to make a projection that accounts for, yeah, these the extreme divergence that you observe uh, in them as we, as we have them. Yeah. Um, hard. But, but yeah, I mean, excellent, excellent copper random, obviously. Um, by the way, we've taken about an hour of your time. I don't remember how long you might have or not have, but feel free to say. I can do Q and A. We could, or I, I have, I have some time. I, you know, okay. I, All right. I have, I have, to, I have to at least, well, one thirty here on the East Coast at the moment. Okay. Uh, other people who have questions, feel free to throw them in the comments. Um, another one I see from B. Yavorsky is, uh, what do you think about the wave spread model uh, versus phylogenetic like trees or clade? Um, there, I mean, I don't think a wave model for all of, for Proto-Indo-Europe, like for the whole spread of the Indo-European languages, uh, is, is the right way to go, but there, obviously the, you know, there are, there are, pro there are features that wave, wave style models capture that, uh, that are, I think, useful for talking about the later develop, you know, the, the sort of the later affiliation languages. And we have to take into account these, um, uh, it, sort of aerial convergence in all of these various ways that we, some of which we've already mentioned, things like, you know, the augment or these phonological similarities between um, a Germanic and uh, Celtic and so on. So, you know, good to, you know, it's, it's best not to just, I don't know, you know, I, I feel like these things can work together, the tree and wave models where it's like, sure. uh, you know, we don't want to just throw up our hands and say, oh, well, it's going to just throw it out of the, you know, throw it out of the tree model converge, you know, it's, it's nicer to to, to be able to, uh, uh, you know, be, be, I don't know, you, know, you could be explicit about the way that these changes are unfolding. Right, right. Um, uh, D. Danson asks, uh, does early Indo-European seem easier to learn or transmit than other languages not in the Indo-European branches at roughly the same time? Uh, than other languages not in the indo at roughly the same time. What are those, like, where it goes, the problem is, uh, the early Indo-European languages are attested much earlier than most. We have historical records for most other non-Indo-European languages. I mean, that's the you know that's the great virtue of working on the Indo-European languages as a historical linguist. You have these early you have these early records. So yeah, there's I mean there are other languages that you have records for like Chinese. Um, they're hard and uh, you know extremely difficult to use. There's a I don't know. There was a nice. You know, I, I'm not you know I, I don't I don't um, you know, I don't, I don't work on on Chinese or anything like that. But there was a book that won. You know, uh, there was a a book ten years ago. I guess at this point, I feel like it was just yesterday, but I think it was something like ten years ago. That's called something just like Old Chinese or something that won a bunch of big linguistic prizes and probably would be a useful starting point for looking at a, another you know set of languages that have a really mm -hmm. deep, long historical record. Um, but what else is known that's contemporary with Britain European? I mean, Attic. Proto Haddock, I don't know, Sumerian, um, Egyptian. Yeah, there's not yeah. that many records. Yeah. Yeah, I was so right. So that's true. That's maybe he was thinking of Semitic languages. I don't know why those didn't come to mind. Um, do they seem easier to, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, for me, I've now learned a bunch of these Indo European, old Indo European languages. And as I was kind of saying at the beginning, it, I don't know, this, if you, maybe you have the same impression, just to be curious, but like, it kind of feels like, once you've got like three or four of them, like they all kind of feel the same. I mean, they have different, they have like their own, you know, each one, they have their own vibes, but like uh, you, it's much easier to pick up the next one after you have yeah. Like, yeah. A Greek or something. And then, all, you know, Hittite, you're just like, it's kind of the, you get past the orthography, it's kind of the same. Yeah, you're never starting from scratch once you've got that background. Um, because everything can build on everything else a little bit. Although I think that you always kind of wind up having your, uh, you know, ones that you're a little stronger with or weaker with. Uh, yeah, Hittite, I mean, once you do get past the orthography, uh, if you look at like that toy Hittite you were talking about, uh, where it's actually written out in what looks like a, a more normal, you know, westernized orthography, it's like, oh yeah, that's just, a, you know, just an archaic and European language. It's the orthography that mm. makes it look so, so hard to, 
read. Yeah, um, maybe maybe some of the other ones are harder though. Like I don't know, like uh, old Irish. Yeah, well, uh, within the interview family, old Irish. A Sumerian is super hard because it's really you know. I mean, in some ways, our our knowledge of Hittite is much better than our knowledge of Sumerian. It's kind of like mm. a lot of the there's a lot of ambiguity and uh, sort of the, the interpretations of things are kind of underdetermined. Um, uh, you know, plenty of good resources though for learning things like Akkadian, and we know we understand these like you know some of the you know those those, those languages very very well. So uh, no, I, my impression is that um, uh, they're probably about the same in terms of learning the similar challenges and uh, uh, yeah, I've never really said you know I've only studied Akkadian informally. I'm actually gonna. Uh, go sit on some Acadian seminars this year with some of my new colleagues uh, cool. uh, here at UCLA. Um, so I'll, maybe I'll be able to weigh in on that in a more informed way. Um, yeah, I did do a little bit of Egyptian. I just, and then someone, you know, that I, I, you know, quickly learned that there are no vowels in the earlier stages. And I was like, what am I supposed to do with this as a linguist? I can't do anything. I'm not here. So. Uh, yeah, that is, that is a tough thing about Egyptian orthography. My grandma read Acadian. Oh yeah. Yeah. She got a master's in it for fun. Cool. Yeah. yeah. That's random little fact. It turns yeah. out that you you know it runs in the it runs in the Crawford family. In a strange way, yeah. Um and neither one of us could ever really explain what interested us to anybody else in the family. Um kind of long uh question or set of questions in the commentary if you want to look at it from davis uh, these most recent comments um says i'm currently reading through how to kill a dragon and it seems that walk-ins relies heavily on indo-iranian and ancient greek with a few forays and old irish that is of course a very interesting book uh, i wonder mm -hmm. if you could comment on this because it seems to me that it wouldn't be sufficient ground to project something all the way back to the Indo european itself um i also have mm -hmm. Issues with some of the formulaics where we have similar semantic meanings, but all the lemmas are different between Latin, Umbria, and, and Sanskrit, and claiming they're PIE descended. Could you just comment on this in general? Because it seems weird to me. Yeah, this is this is like a good. I mean, so so maybe there, there's a couple of interesting things. I mean, one 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 reason we rely so heavily on Indo-Iranian and ancient Greek. Those are <laughs> so those are two big early attested branches for which we have. Uh, you know, and the earliest, the earliest material, I mean, if you leave it aside, Mycenaean Greek, obviously just sort of, you know, administrative records and so on. We have for, at a very, very early point, like rich mythological traditions attested for these languages. So that kind of makes them, it gives them intrinsic importance for, you know, for if you're interested in studying things like, you know, Indo-European, uh, yeah, comparative mythology, basically, and, uh, and comparative poetics. So. So I may I should add that part too. They're mythological texts in poem, you know, in and their poetry. So that, that that makes them kind of natural to use as sources for this. Um, Cal's interest in Old Irish, um, Cal Watkins. He there was a point one of one of Cal's big ideas in Indo-European was that really Old Irish was very 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 archaic. Like that was one of the big, especially in its verbal system. That was the idea that that really. Um, uh, there were there were lots of parallels between uh, inter well in interesting and important uh, significant morphological parallels between it uh, and uh, especially Anatolian uh, the linguistic level and so it was sort of less surprising to find kind of it, it would it, if that, if that were all if that were all true then uh, uh, then uh, then it wouldn't be all that surprising to find maybe really kind of remarkable archaisms uh, in Irish phraseology and things like that. Uh, but you know, this is one of the ones that kind of never really panned out. Like the stuff that that sort of Cal saw as fabulous archaisms, these in, in the verbal system, these really didn't kind of win win wide acceptance. Uh, mm -hmm. and so, uh, so so maybe you know, if you're interested in wh why why uh Cal Watkins was you know, it, it, but but maybe that's the wrong way of saying. It. I mean, he was also just really interested in in old Irish. He you know went and studied in Ireland and uh and just thought it was really culturally interesting and so you know in some ways it wouldn't be that surprising like any like you know like any end european language it could be a place you, you know you can find an archaism anywhere so um uh but yeah so uh do, do, do the other thing that the person is talking about here this issue of lexical replacement um sorry that's a you know semantic similar semantic meaning so we have we can say that you know he, he killed the dragon 
uh, where the where the he killed part is no longer realized by the same when verb, and the dragon one is no longer the uh, the aki, you know, in Sanskrit, where the the old the whim <laughs> the that part's gone too, and it's replaced by some other mod, you know, some other word for for you know for serpent like serpent or something like that. Um, lexical replacement is kind of a fundamental problem of doing uh, a comparative, you know, comparing formulas because we really there's no check on it right so you you know mm. you you identify a common theme and uh and what 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 you know it it, it just means that you know the the idea of he slew the serpent is is like typologically totally normal right like this is the kind of this is the kind of thing that you that gets generated in in, in non-Indian European traditions as well and what's really cool and interesting about it from the European perspective is that we're able to actually reconstruct the the, the lexical bits of it and they agree in in the oldest traditions and so this issue of lexical replacement like if we just allow we can't you know it, it, it it's much it's much harder to say anything with yeah, yeah with certainty uh, when we're just saying oh you know the the the, the really the the substance of the equation um uh is is disrupted so so one should be very cautious about these things and i think people broadly have and this is why we haven't seen you know well, you know, more, I don't know, you know, the, it, the people who were working on this in the old days were really, really good, really good readers of text. And if there were things as striking as uh, Hanahim matching, uh, you know, that matching, I don't know, I mean, even Hittite with, with the one piece replaced, you know, Quenta Ilyankan or something. It's like if there were, if there were tons of more things that were, you know, uh, places where the, uh, where the where the where the vocabulary agreed with respect to true cognacy, then people would have noticed that, and uh, and so you know, it's, it's, it, people were left to like kind of look to things like lexical replacement as a kind of I don't know to try to find something, but but it, it just feels way less secure, and I think it, it less convincing. Yeah, and I I think that there is, you know, his book is very bold. Um, it's also extremely well learned. I mean, he was an incredible philologist. Um, I think that when you're looking at these reconstructed phrases like that, what you can think of maybe, see what you think of this analogy, is you have a, a red to blue spectrum, right? Like you're looking at a prism. And mm -hmm. it's, it's fascinating when you find in descendant languages uh, a phrase that has like the red and the orange. Someone else has like the yellow and the green someone else maybe has the green and the blue. It's like, okay, we can kind of put together the whole prism spectrum, but mm -hmm. no language has the entire red to blue, but we can actually see adjoining pieces show up the same in the same quarter almost is maybe an analogy. Yeah. So like, you're never going to find- That is yeah, yeah, yeah. That I do okay. I like to think yeah. I can make good analogy. No, no, that's a great analogy. It's just like, so, but the, right. So the, the ones where you, uh, uh, where you, yeah, yeah, that's a. I, I think that's a great way of, of of putting it, and and the kind of the more pieces where you can put together like that, where you can build the build out that whole spectrum, the more plausible it does kind of look, right? Where it's not there yeah. are not, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know, you know. Ultimately, I think the there's a lot of skeptical people in this field, and and uh, uh, which is good, uh, you know. There's also a lot of less skeptical people, but it's good, to, yes. you know. I, I think that there's definitely a set that will only really be convinced when you can find um you know exact word equations for things and uh and just because lexical replacement it's slippery you know it's it's, pro it's it almost oh, certainly yeah. happens i mean I think we could you could like you can point to the the dragon slang one formula is a really good example where it kind of like there's enough evidence that you really want to reconstruct the thing but then you do have to say in individual traditions like things like in hittite you know they replace the serpent word with this serpent creature word uh, at least in that in the iteration of the myth that we have attested. Well, and then I mean, it, 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 these things can change so radically fast. I mean, one of the things that's amazing about modern Icelandic is as morphologically conservative as it is, it's idiomatically bizarre as Germanic language, right? I mean, like if you don't study modern Icelandic per se, you are like never going to guess the right idioms for saying tons of things because it's just weird idioms from a Germanic language perspective where English mm. and continental Scandinavian languages are idiomatically pretty similar. And that's not just content, 
right? I mean, it, I'm talking about like 1700s Norwegian Swedish is like idiomatically more similar to English than 1700s Icelandic. Um, or then you look at weird things that can change real fast, like uh, noun mm -hmm. gender. Uh, you know, my background being strongest in Scandinavian languages, I, you know, I'm almost never wrong about the gender of a word in a Scandinavian language, but I'm almost never right about the gender of a word in German. <laughs> right? Scandinavian and German have like totally different uh grammatical gender for for nouns yeah. and it's like the words will be cognate but like i can never freaking guess the gender of a word in german it's like why you know um yeah i huh. i didn't realize that it was that that startling but that just shows you i don't know the modern icelandic languages all that well or even even the old ones as well as i should despite my excellent teachers um, oh well yeah <laughs> yeah just stuck with it more germanic is really cool and interesting and i uh uh you know I don't know, maybe hopefully there'll be some occasion to, to kind of leap back into it. I still think a lot of the old verbal morphology is really more archaic than uh, than people. Well, as archaic as people in the, you know, believe once ago, but but not as, you know, more so than people, I assume most of the Europeans believe it is now. Well, uh, you know, in January, they found or announced the discovery of the oldest uh, known writing in runes, which makes it almost the oldest known Leskal items in Germanic. So I guess there's just a tiny, tiny chance that we're going to get, you know, some incredibly archaic level of Germanic at some level that we've never seen before. That would be neat to see. That's uh, so cool. It's really, it is cool that there are these kind of new, new discoveries that actually can really impact your understanding of these things. I, I watched your video on the, uh, uh, the at least the initial one, I think, and then maybe you did a talk. Did you also talk to someone about this last week yeah. or a couple of weeks ago? Well, I did, I posted a talk from Utah where I talked about it some, because um, I've been kind of, I I definitely had this sort of fever dream obsession for a while after this was announced with uh, how I thought it strengthened the case for uh, a non-Latin derivation for the runic alphabet. Um, mm -hmm which I'm still pretty hung up on. I really don't think it's from the Latin alphabet, but that's, you know. You can get all that out of uh, out of uh, one, it's, it's just one name, right, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's one name, and then it's the beginning of the alphabet sequence. But no, I, I, I think that the further back that you push the origin of runes, the harder it is to make the place and time argument for the Latin alphabet, which I think is actually the strongest argument for the Latin alphabet. Um, mm. You know, there's, in terms of letter features and some meta features, like the commonness of Bustrophodon and right-to-left writing, it's a lot more mm -hmm. like the, the archaic alphabets used in the Alps, which is my current argument. I mean, that's not exactly historical linguistics. It's more like historical alphabetics, historical graphemics. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, people are working on, I mean, this is one that's really active. People are doing all, you know, finding all kinds of, uh, uh, interesting things there's a like a big debate you know raging uh right now there's just there was just a recent article not so long ago talking about how you know it, it, at least it, it minimally disputing a piece of evidence for the idea that like the greek uh the greek alphabet is it comes from uh, uh you know uh comes from phoenician right so uh there's Versus like there was an article you know, I, I tried to stay, I've tried to kind of steer clear of this. I've been really busy, so I'm trying not to get too, too paddled in, but there's, you know, too sucked into this. But yeah, there's, the, you know, there's this famous, you know, Herodotus calls the, uh, the Greek, you know, the, um, you know, he prefers the, you know, whether the Poinikeia, you know, uh, whatever, uh, the, you know, he calls the letters, the Greek letters, Phoenician or something. Well, these people thought it was Phoenician, but there's a, this paper, uh, from, uh, uh, this woman, uh, Philemon Vollet, uh, that Leiden arguing that like these, this is a reference not to uh, Phoenician, but it's a, a use of Poinix to refer to, I think like the color, it can refer to red and, and this is, it maybe refers to writing on uh, palm leaves. Um, uh, and so this would, you know, undermine at least some piece of evidence for that. I thought, anyway, I'll, I'll just say, I, I, you know, I was just, I've, I've kind of stayed, you know, I listened to some people talk about this stuff and uh, there's definitely uh, the writing system wars are not going to be settled anytime, anytime soon. Oh no, sure, but 
I, I'm surprised at the notion of Greek not having a Phoenician origin. I mean, like if you were arguing yeah. that it's like some some other Semitic alphabet that's like related to Phoenician, like okay, but uh, beyond that, yeah, I, 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 I don't. I, no, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I will think about this more when I sit down and prepare materials to teach writing systems next year. But, um, but cool. in the meantime, I've tried to just kind of like sit down and stick. But maybe, 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 ooh, maybe, maybe I can pin you down to come talk about runes. That would be fun. That'd be fun. Yeah. And uh, I've actually become pretty well read on ancient varieties of the Greek alphabets now. I have read extensively about this stuff and trying to figure out, you know, what Greek alphabets wound up where. And man, I can tell you all kinds of stuff about like, Sthan and all and Copa and all these other forgotten letters. Um, is this because you're trying to like kind of do it like like you know is this part of the kind of like okay trying to understand the type like sort of a typology of how these writing systems emerge in order to kind of situate claims about the uh, about the about the runic alphabet? Yeah, and there's a lot about runes. It's a lot like these archaic Greek alphabets down to letter forms, and it's like how did this happen? Because I don't think that they're learning it from Greeks in the 500s BC. You know, so it's like, mm -hmm. where, where did this variety wind up and who was using this where? And it's, um, it's a weird story. And people are so it... conservative about alphabets, you know, like they'll just keep letters forever that they don't need, um, which is mm -hmm. part of what makes or, this or, complicated. Or suddenly they change very quickly and they're like, we're not doing any of that. We're doing like, we're going to, yes. uh, uh, you know, make, make this. Like we're going to design something that actually makes sense. Yeah, I, I actually, this is totally cool, but I've, I've, yeah, I've always found that there's kind of, a, there's definitely a gap I, that I've at various times kind of grappled with in like, yeah, kind of like a, uh, a kind of typology of how writing systems uh, do and don't change over time, what they do and don't represent uh, in terms, you know, their, let us say their relationship with the sound system of the language at a given time. Um, I, you know, it's like one would like to, it's a really, I mean, these are hard questions to ask because, you know, you're, I don't know, you know, you're, you're, you, you're both, you know, you're asking what is the relationship between this and the actual spoken language at the time. And it's like, you're, but you're also only using the writing evidence to figure out what the, what the spoken language sounded like at the time. I guess you're trying to triangulate it with other bits, but there's this very, there's a very high degree of danger of circularity but in, in any rate yeah. i've always thought it was cool like what yeah this question of how, how do writing systems uh you know evolve general i mean you know they're the kind of uh you know the, the same questions we ask about languages but with this 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 at this further level of remove is how do you actually represent uh uh, uh yeah i don't know linguistic change yeah and you're also a specialist in a language that has uh an incredibly bad uh graphenic uh, representation so some people think it's worse than others i i am one of the one who i'm in the i'm in the it's bad camp so i'm glad you say it that <laughs> way but, <laughs> but then there's people who are like no no like actually there's way less you know there, there there's way more significance to their choice of ta instead of da in this context and my, my thought is no nah, i don't think so i think this is just a lot of arbitrariness um yeah uh, well, I think there's a lot of arbitrariness in, in uh, just about any writing system adapted from one related language to another. Uh, and I think you see it in runes, and I think you see it in Greek. But, mm -hmm. but that all... Uh, this, that, uh, let, me ask, let me ask you about the root thing. Do you feel like this is like, I don't know, have there been like big reactions to this? Is it shaken up any? Like, is this like a, you know, like I said, this paper that we're ta we've been talking about with this Indo-European paper, it's like, there's going to be people fighting about like there's, there's going to be there's going to be some fire I think and I'm curious if that's happened on the on the Germanic side with the rune discoveries or yeah 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 or yeah 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 with the runic the rune discoveries um I don't know that I've seen any like big theoretical reactions to it just yet um people tend to be a little bit slow and pretty small C conservative in reacting to these things, uh, partially because there's a fair amount of judgment about people who go and, you know, rush to the popular press or the wider red academic press with anything about runes, um, especially outside of Scandinavia. There's just such an association of it with like sensationalism. Mm -hmm. um, 
I haven't seen any any big level theoretical reactions to this stuff. Um, I did just receive a new paper about uh, one of these new discoveries from this year because there was also in March the discovery of the oldest written form of a the name of a Norse god, which is pretty cool. Uh, mm -hmm. I just received a new paper about that that I haven't looked at yet because I got it like yesterday. Um, you know, there may be something in there, but uh, no, I can't say that I've seen anything. And I haven't seen a whole lot of reaction from Germanic specialists to this new paper about Indo-European grouping either, but that's also pretty new. This is, I mean, yeah, like I said, we got an early preview of this at, at, uh, at the UCLA conference in the fall, but this is, yeah, this is, this is basically, you know, just came out uh, in like the last couple of weeks or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, it's definitely going to, you know, Andrew Garrett has a nice thread on this about a little, a nice little thread uh, on, on this about on Twitter um, for people who are interested. Uh, just uh, he says some of the things that some of the things that I discussed uh, here today, but um, okay. you know, linguists, <laughs> linguists are going to have reservations and, uh, and, you know, but, but maybe some of them will, you know, hop over and try to make a, a kind of sort of a compelling linguistic argument for, for the, for the early chronology. I, I don't, you know, I can think of people who might go that direction, but, um, but, uh, you know, uh, I can think of one. I, uh, uh, do, do you have time for either of the two for the questions that are in the chat? Um, Jay had asked what you're last interested two. in. Yeah. What, what, yeah. What, so Jay asked, uh, beyond what we've talked about, what are you interested in or, or working on and can do your opinion? Yeah, um, sure. Uh, so just, Quickly for, for for Jay's question, yeah. Um, so one of the reasons that I've, you know, w one of the broader questions that animates my research is this question of how do um, pr prosodic systems, so you know, like you know, things about like word stress uh, and the the effects that it sort of conditions on other on other sounds in a word. Um, how do, how do those change over time? And Indo-European is a super good, useful. Uh, so it's I think Indo-European is the the the, the main place where we can ask those kinds of questions if we want to do it over the long haul. So not like just, you know, talking about, like, you know, uh, intergenerational change, but how do these things change over many sort of centuries and millennia because they have these really long historical records and we can say something relatively precise about the about the proto language. Um, so so um, so, I, you know, I've worked on this in other domains, too. I, I worked on this in U.S. Uh, U.S. Tekken and um, uh, and there, you know, it's, it's the problem we were talking about earlier where it's well, in, uh, that you don't have these early records, so you're quite far from the proto language when you have the languages showing up, and uh, you also have the problem of uh, that uh, there's just way less uh, good comparative work that's been done on the family, and so you know we know less about the proto language or even the intermediate proto, -lang proto languages. Um, so it's you know you're you're kind of working with more more unknowns. At any rate, I just think that. Uh, uh, I, that's what I'm interested. It's, it's just for me, this is a really super interesting question: is how do how do how do stress systems change over time? And um, and Indo-European is one one lens uh, for for looking at them. And so, if you go to my academia page, or better yet, my website, I have more stuff on there. You know, you'll just see all these papers about like word stress and its effects on Indo-European uh, vowel alternations, ablaut, and uh, and you know, that's the big question that. That that uh, you know that I'm kind of using Indo-European to look at, but it's definitely a question that goes beyond Indo-European. And your website is freehittitelovesecrets.com. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, you got it. Oh man, I, how did you know? That's uh, just you file that one away in your brain. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, and yeah, there's this other question about how much of the Anatolian, how much of the known text have been had have been edited and published, and how much is there still out there. Uh, and if much of that, if we know, is Hittite versus the other languages, yeah, um, most have been uh, edited and published. Um, uh, and of that, most uh, so there are some Hittite texts that are, um, uh, or at least you know, t texts from you know Hittite context where we would expect to find Hittite. So like the Hattusa uh, archive or some of the other neighboring um, uh, cities. That so most of it has been published. Uh, uh, you know in you know, in cuneiform editions, uh, in cuneiform, uh, you know, hand copies and so on. Uh, and, 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 and and of that most, most of that has been also sort of transliterated and, and rendered into, um, you know, editions that are usable by like not, non, non strictly specialists. Um, so, so there's some still, we might, you know, there's some, there's some unpublished Hittite, 
uh, or or things that are going to probably be mostly Hittite, um, but um, but not much. And how much of that that we know is Hittite? For, yeah. So right. So in, in in the records, so say from the from the the archives at Hattusa, there's not just Hittite, but we also have um, uh, Luvian uh, in well in multiple dialectal varieties, also Palaic and Hattic and um, uh, you know, uh, probably, uh, oh, I think I saw, I saw that at the new Hittite Congress, I saw, I was just reading through abstracts and I think someone, there's an abstract from someone claiming that maybe we have a little bit of Gaskin, um, maybe, uh, which would be, uh, this is the, these are like the perennial um, sort of rivals of the Hittites. Uh, they were sort of these mountain people who live to the north of the Hittites. And anytime the Hittites would kind of spend too much time uh, kind of, uh, you know, wor worrying about and going, doing conquest with their, you know, going southward or, you know, sort of southeast into Mesopotamia or or westward into Western Anatolia, um, then like, you know, uh, then the Gaskins would come in and like pillage and plunder and, uh, you know, at various points, they even got so far as to, uh, to, to you know, to, to, to pillage the Hittite capital. So, um, so anyway, all this to say is that we may have a tiny bit of that. Um, could other things show up? conceivably but there's just not there's not a you know there's not a, there's not a ton um that that now w of course the, the big thing we would really like is let's find some more like it would be cool if we could some, someone really you know uh, discovered a new archive or something it doesn't seem all you know super likely or there's nothing to suggest that that's going to happen anytime soon but it would be cool if it did true or you know some more inscriptions with some luvian or something yeah, yeah that that um, that that seems likelier, actually. You know, it, it seems like there's, you know, we just had a new one, uh, a, a new a new kind of significant Luvian inscription that people is, have been arguing about. Um, it's got this uh, 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 reference to the um, to the Phrygians um, on it, and uh, and this has been then the, the dating of this inscription has been much discussed, whether it's very early or. Or, or it could be a very early Luvian uh, inscription, or whether it's it is the native Anatolian hieroglyphs, of course, uh, uh, and or whether it's quite late. And there's a you know there's a there's a a, a lively debate um, uh, going on about that right now for <laughs> folks who are interested. And by the way, the the uh, Gascon does that look like it might be Anatolian or something else? I think this would just be some non-European language. I, I don't know. I don't even know. I, like I said, I just it was just it caught my eye as I was scanning through. So there's a big Hittitology Congress every two years. There's a, uh, yeah, a, you know, a worldwide Hittite conference, and I, I think it's always in Turkey, but maybe it, I don't know. At any rate, it's in Turkey this year, and um, it's the first time I've ever gone, so I'm kind of excited about it. And um, uh, and I just saw an app. I was just flipping through the abstracts booklet that they sent out. I saw this one, so. That's so cool. maybe there's more. It, it is cool. I mean, you know, it, it it's uh, yeah, you know, the Hittites were they kept kept little bits and preserved little bits of the languages of their neighbors, and you know, it's, uh, it's nice. It's nice that they showed up. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for taking the time with us today, and uh, I'll hope to have you back on again soon to talk about. I don't know. There's so much we can cover. Maybe we should do like a. Uh, a, a somewhat regular time series just to talk about like Indo-European news like this. Uh, cool. I love that. Yeah. It's, I was going to say, wait, let's not make it two years. I would like to look not noticeably, you know, more youthful in the, you know, from appearance <laughs> to appearance. Or, I don't think, you know, time yeah. is not going to stop though. So yeah, let's, let's do that. I, you know, if people are interested, then I think that would be fun. Okay. Well, I think it'd be a fun little feature to, to do a little bit more regularly. Um, so, well, thanks for your time. I hope you have a great rest of your summer and, uh, hope to talk to you soon. Thanks. Likewise. Talk soon. Thank you all for uh, coming and asking interesting questions. Yeah. Thank you, Patreon, very much and all the best to everybody. <laughs>